On Amur is one of these cities. Here, the snow-covered taiga is shaken by the roar of the engines of fighters taking off to the blue far eastern skies. One of the unique plants of Russia, the Komsomorsk on Amur Aircraft Production Association, Knapo, is situated here. Napo, the largest aircraft plant in Russia. Cutting edge equipment and technologies are used here. Currently, the aircraft manufacturer in Komsomorsk on Amur is participating in most ambitious and promising programs of the Russian aircraft industry. Today, we work on prototypes of the Sukhoi aircraft. We are very proactive today on making prototypes of the future tactical fighter and virtually launched the full-rate production of components of the Sukhoi Superjet 100 regional airliner. Knapo is an aircraft-making giant. It employs about 20,000 residents of Komsomorsk on Amur. Many of them are descendants of the aircraft makers who came to the Far East in the 1930s to make planes in the Taiga. It is at that time that the first page of the glorious history of the plant was opened. In this movie, we will tell you about the key milestones on the way covered by the company since then, about the present day of the company. We decided to start our travel in time from the Plants Museum here. Our guide will be one of the oldest employees of the company, Abram Aroginka. I believe the city and plant are unique because the construction of both was conceived to take place in the absolutely uninhabited taiga, very far not only from industrial centers, but from urbanized areas as well. In the early 1930s, the relations between militarist Japan and the Soviet Union were very strained. Having seized northeast China in 1931, the Japanese got in the immediate vicinity of the Soviet border. The government of the Soviet Union then ordered the large-scale construction in the Far East, and a decision was taken to create a major industrial military center on the bank of the river Amur, a kind of advanced post of the Soviet state. Under the governmental resolution, the taiga-covered bank of the river was to see a city emerge in which a shipyard and an aircraft plant were to be built in 1932 at a point named Komsomorsk appeared in the maps of the Soviet Union. To a large extent, the city owes its name Komsomorsk to Jan Gamarnik, Deputy People's Commissar of the Defense in January 1932, Gamarnik was tasked with picking up a place to build the city. Army Commander Blucher allocated a special plane to this end. The commission worked on the Taiga for several days. Finally, they select the left bank of the River Amur for the construction site. Immediately, a question crops up. Who is going to build the city in the impassable terrain, virtually unfit for people to live in? Gamarnik suggested challenging Soviet youth to do it. On 
Already in May 1932, about 1,000 volunteers arrived on board the Comintern and Columbus steamers. A bit later, the Captain Karpenka docked near the Nai Nomad camp, Jomgi, and the first group of the aircraft plant builders disembarked from her. People were going there with enthusiasm, and actually their enthusiasm was continuous. It was the time of the early five-year plans, time of adventure for youth. Slogans like, let there be aviation, let there be industrial development, therefore a lot hinged on enthusiasm. However, the enthusiasm was not enough at times, because the living conditions were very hard. The builders initially lived in tents and makeshift shelters of branches. Famous Soviet film director Sergei Gerasimov, in his film Komsomolsk, which was first shown in 1938, conveyed the atmosphere and some of the sentiments of the time very accurately. In the beginning of the film, the character of Tamara Makarova comes from Leningrad to her husband to the construction site of Komsomorsk. Did she come here to live? Do you like the tree stump? Try to tear it out of the ground. I don't want to dig in the ground any longer, and I don't want to rot in the rain and in the bogs. The engineer played by Ivan Novoselsev did stay in Komsomorsk and naturally made his peace with his wife but everything would often be quite different in real life. Some of the early builders reminisced that when they were sent here by the Young Communist League committees, they were told, don't take anything with you. There is everything there. You will be issued everything there. Clothes, footwear, food. Everything. A lad showed up in his best shoes that survived exactly two days of walking in the bog. Another one came in canvas shoes that were usually absolutely. The clothes problem was the same. Still, the lack of necessary amenities, harsh snowstorms in winter and unbearable swarms of midges in summer could not prevent the construction of the city and plant. People worked almost without rest and were given only one day off for every 10 working days. People would come home from work, drop in their bunkhouses, sleep, get up in the morning, and everything would repeat itself. Come on, guys, get up. Hey, can't you hear me? What's up? Why? The first plant facilities and first bunkhouses were built in summer 1932. Life began to look up, but something terrible happened suddenly. The builders failed to consider a very important feature of the river. Unlike the rivers in the European part of Russia, the Amur burst its banks in the autumn. During the summer, the snow melting in the mountains fills the Amur's confluence. A huge flood took place in autumn 1932, virtually wiping out what had been built by then. The project had to be revised. The construction site had to be shifted four and a half kilometers away from the bank. Everything began afresh. Sleepless nights, hard work, and incredible confidence in their strength. Then winter came in. Winter 1932-1933 was very harsh. To cap it all, the living and working conditions were very severe. Therefore, surviving the winter was difficult. We survived, but it was clear that the plant and city could not be built with what we had then. Moscow decides to send military builders to help the Young Communist League members. On September 22, 1933, People's Commissar Voroshilov orders the activation of the Special Military Construction Corps. The Corps had to 45 days for the activation and preparations. Soon afterwards, the military builders come to Khabarovsk, from which 6,000 men are headed to Komsomorsk via the ice-covered River Amur. There are no other ways to get here at the time. 400 kilometers on ice and snow, in snowstorms and frost, 
from four in the morning until midnight, driven by the sole goal of reaching their destination. Near Malmuge, the 30th Battalion heading to Komsomorsk to build the aviation plant was caught by a snowstorm. In this snow glaze, some soldiers lost their way. The danger was incredible. The help came from the battalion's commissar. He noticed a lodge on the riverbank and ordered to set it on fire. The fire was like a lighthouse for the lost soldiers. They found their file and the battalion reached Komsomorsk without any losses. The Special Military Construction Corps soldiers were welcomed like heroes in Komsomorsk. The military rendered invaluable assistance in building the aircraft plant. The first stone was laid in the foundation of the main engineering shop on July 18, 1934. And the first shop, the Tool One, was launched almost a year later, on July 15, 1935. A few months later, most of the production and auxiliary shops were ready. In 1936, the plant started producing its first aircraft, the R-6, designed by Andrei Tupolev. The story of this plane is rather dramatic to our plant. Firstly, the production of the R-6 had been discontinued by then at the aircraft plants in the European part of Russia. No one needed it any longer. Secondly, the warplane had been obsolete by then. The plant's new team, inexperienced in producing planes, had an opportunity to train on the model already produced by other plants. However, everything turned out to be much more complicated. The plants which had stopped the R6 production shipped all remaining parts to us. Two or three plants sent those parts in a heap. Firstly, each of the plants had its own peculiarities and even its own shape of the parts. So when we tried to assemble a plane out of the parts, everything turned out to be pretty difficult. The Komsomorsk workers had to show inventiveness and technical savvy power to devise their own assembly technology because they had nobody else to ask for help. In spite of the difficulties, the plant made its first R6 plane on May 1st, 1936. The plant made a total of 20 aircraft of the R6 type, of which it was proud. Those were its first aircraft. Today, the plant has built thousands of planes of dozens of types. The plant has a reason to be proud of it, as it had from the outset. The present-day company is an aircraft-making center using cutting-age technologies. All manufacturing processes are integrated together and controlled by means of sophisticated computer programs. The future is impossible without the past. Having scored their first victory in May 1936, the Komsomorsk aircraft makers established the traditions that served as the mainstay of the uniqueness and professional longevity of Knapov. Yeah. I became acquainted with the plant and met its team in 1982. It so happened that the aircraft plant in Irkutsk sent me to Komsomorsk. 
There, I realized that the team at the plant Komsomoysk was far more dynamic, far more independent, and more target-oriented. I have always cited the Komsomoysk plant as an example of professionalism and drive for results. Our planes are quality products. They will always be in demand. Therefore, I believe that the aircraft making owns the future. I realize that the future of the city is in the hands of such aircraft makers as I am. Optimism and confidence in its future are Kapos' feature based on the wealth of experience of previous generations and truly artist's work. The Komsomoysk aircraft makers passed various trials, including the Second World War and terrible years of Stalin's repressions. Winter 1938. The plant's director Kuznetsov, chief engineer Zverev, Communist Party Committee Secretary Indisov, and Young Communist League Committee Secretary Vilinov were arrested and accused of sabotage and derailing the governmental DB3 long-range bomber production program. The R-6 was still in production when the order came to produce the DB-3. The DB-3 was a serious plane. I mean, not just serious, but a very advanced plane at the time, developed by Illusion. The plane necessitated very serious work. The plant spent the whole of 1937 trying to produce it because the plane was very complicated in design terms, especially its wing. The technology was murder, the design and technology. Some elements of the wing had to be made virtually blind, by touch. Defects could be detected only by X-ray in the final stages of production. Remedying the defects called for more time and money. Under a resolution of the Council of Labor and Defense, the first planes from the Komsomorsk plant were to be fielded in 1937. Given the problems encountered in the production of the DB-3, Moscow promised a technical support team to the plant. But the Moscow engineers did not come to Komsomorsk in 1937. Unfortunately, it was not the only problem encountered. We were short of basic equipment, half-finished product, punching equipment, augers, machine tools, let alone the fact that the area used and human resources were limited. Everything was so difficult. The promised help arrived only a year later. Still, the situation was remedied owing to the huge endeavor of the Komsomorsk personnel and Moscow specialists. The production plan for the first 30 bombers was fulfilled. Two years after his arrest, the plant's director, Kuznetsov, was released from the jail in Khabarovsk in the absence of the crime in act. Another year later, the war broke out. August 1941. On the night of the 7th to the 8th, unknown aircraft appear in the skies over Berlin. When bombs rained down on the city, Nazi command was shocked. It couldn't occur to the Nazis that the capital of the Third Reich was being bombed by the Russians. And that night, five bombers dropped its mortal load on Berlin. Germany was bombed by Aleutian long-range bombers. It is this aircraft that became the mainstay of the plant's production during the war. The plant had built the DB-3F, dubbed it IL-4, in 1942 until 1945. Everything needed to make planes had to be delivered from the plants west of Komsomolsk. The war broke out, and all those plants started evacuating eastwards. In the process, our plant was receiving virtually nothing from them. But still, we had to deliver planes. 
So the plant started making rolled aluminum, shapes, and pipes. We lacked machine tools, so we made turning machines because we could rely. Komsomolsk built aircraft that we jokingly called Komsomolka, a colloquialism for a female member of the Uncommon League, were fitted with small advanced device of a kind of handle that simplified some in-flight operations. This is what made those aircraft different from others. Actually, they were really good aircraft, and we liked them very much. In all, the plant built 2,757 Aleutian long-range bombers during the war. In July 1942, the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR awarded an Order of Lenin to Aircraft Plant Number 126 in Komsomorsk on Amur for its exemplary fulfillment of governmental orders for warplane manufacture. The current generation of engineers, specialists and technicians at the plant may be proud of their having something to do with those distant... ...there is nothing faster than time in this world. In historical terms, the 65 years that have passed since the war are just an instant. But for a person there, almost all of his or her life. Over these years, the plant in Komsomolsk rose from pistoned engine planes to supersonic, super maneuverable fighters. Now, Knapo maintains close ties with combat pilots, as it did during the war. On December 23, 2004, the company delivered upgrade Sukhoi fighters, Sukhoi 27SM, to the Russian Air Force. The 23rd Talon Fighter Air Regiment was among the first units to be fielded with them. Our regiment has been closely linked with the Komsomorsk-based aircraft manufacturer. This was true in 1985, when we were anticipating the advent of the fourth-generation Sukhoi 27 fighter. The same goes for 2004, when the regiment took delivery of the first upgraded fighters of this type. The plane is very easy to fly. It obeys the control column quite easily. Flying it is a pleasure. And after a flight, the pilot feels joy at the least, but more often, just pure delight. The aircraft can handle very many tasks previously uncharacteristic of fighters. Now, the pilot can do his job far better. Thank you, Knapo. The synonym for builder is creator, the creator of the new. The notion is fully applicable to Knapo. The aircraft manufacturer is experienced in making all kinds of aircraft. At various times, the plant used to make boats, yachts, and even children's bicycles. In the late 50s, it produced all-metal sports gliders designed by Oleg Antonov. Aircraft technologies also were used in making propeller slates, developed by the Kamov Design Bureau. However, the most unusual job done by the plant was probably the manufacture of combat missiles for the Soviet Navy. 
A special production complex was built at the plant and fitted with unique equipment. The first Komsomolsk-made missile was the B-6, later succeeded by the Amethyst missile. Overall, the plant had made cruise missiles for almost 20 years. However, let us return to Knapo's aviation history. the governmental orders for the Il-4 bomber ceased. Still, the team, which numbered several thousand people at the time, did not sit idle. At the time, people badly needed common things. The plan started making everything it could, while using everything it had. It started making tableware, beds, furniture, overalls, trolleys, bicycles, you name it. Certainly the consumer good production was important, but it was clearly well below the skills of the plant's personnel. The plant needed a plane to make, and such a plane appeared in the form of the Li-2 transport. The advent of the Li-2 became a kind of symbol of the time of peace. The early planes made by the plant took to the skies in 1947. The Li-2 had been in production until 1950. 20 out of the 355 units were in the passenger variant. In spite of the huge experience gained during the war, the production of the new aircraft was not smooth. Its pedigree was to blame. The Li-2 was a company of the US Douglas DC-3. The conversion of the inches into centimeters proved troublesome to the plant's engineers. The drafts included tenth, hundredth, and even thousand parts of a millimeter. Nonetheless, the production of the aircraft was a good school in civilian plane construction. In 1977, the plant took part in making the Illusion 62M airliner. In the late 90s, Knapo made the Beriev 103 light amphibian and its modifications, and the Suhoi 80 multifunction civilian aircraft as well. Today, Knapo is a full-fledged participant in the Federal Civil Aviation Development Program. Итак, встречайте Suhoi Superjet 100. The Suhoi Superjet 100 regional airliner. The aircraft was unveiled in Komsomorsk on Amur in September 2007. For the first time in history of Russian aviation, the plane became the hero of a truly breathtaking show. And it was not just an obvious attempt to follow the aviation fashion. Now the Suhoi Superjet 100 is among the most promising programs of the Russian civil aviation. As part of the Suhoi holding company, Knapo joined the development of the aircraft as far back as 2003. Knapo is the maker of main assemblies, including its wing, to fit the Suhoi Superjet 100. 